Welcome to Follow the Medical Record, where healthcare experts give insights into the increasing importance of following a patient's medical record through the health ecosystem with compliance, privacy, security, and efficiency front and center. This podcast is brought to you by MRO and hosted by Don Hardwick, Senior Vice President of Client Relations at MRO. Don has been in the health information management industry for over 40 years and has extensive knowledge of how medical records make their way through the healthcare ecosystem. At MRO, Don is responsible for strategic client engagement programs and overall client satisfaction. To hear from all of MRO's industry experts, be sure to visit MROCorp.com for additional content and to sign up for our monthly e-newsletter. Over to you, Don. And welcome to another insightful session as we follow the medical record. I'm your host, Don Hardwicks, and thanks for listening in today. You can learn a little bit more about MRO and myself on our website at MROCORP.com. And if you get a chance, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you a little bit about how you feel about the program. We have as our guest today, Allison Cozy, who's the Regional Director of Account Management for MRO and came to our organization with over, yes, Allison, I'm going to say it, uh, 25 years experience as a Director of Health Information Management, Privacy, Compliance, and Quality Assurance in a multi-hospital health system and our responsibilities also included the oversight of record management for several hundred physician practices that were spread out uh, over multiple states. So, Allison, welcome to the show today. Thanks, Don. I'm very excited to be here. And I did start working when I was an infant, so that's how I have 25 years of I knew that was going to be the <laughs> answer before I even said it. So I, I want to make sure that everybody's clear. She did start as an infant in this uh, profession. Thanks, Don. We've heard the phrase, Allison, follow the money. And you'll discover the motivation behind many different things. But in the healthcare industry, following the medical record leads to a core of better healthcare delivery and many other uses. So today, what I'd like to talk about is sort of the history behind the medical record and the multiple uses that it is generated, that's generated out of the medical documentation that occurs. So that said, can you give us a little bit of the known, maybe the earliest known recording of health information and how it started to migrate into its current sort of centerpiece in the healthcare industry? So some of the early history of the medical record and its earliest recording um, has been around for, you know, over 100 years. Back in the day, you know, there wasn't as much advancement with technology and documentation and keeping records. But it's interesting. I've worked in organizations where they've had, um, you know, a birth log or a death log, um, you know, handwritten back 100 years ago where a patient came in and they have who they came with, who they left with, what their diagnosis was. And while the technology and the advancement in um, treatment has changed, it's still interesting that they've always been very um, aware of documenting what's going on with the patient. Of course, back then, if a patient was seen in, let's say, in one state and traveled somewhere else, that information never followed them. So a lot of the, you know, healthcare needs of that patient weren't communicated to the next provider. So it was hard to manage different diseases and, and issues that were arising with that patient. So it became more common, I would say, you know, in the early um, part of the century where um, documentation was used on paper and, um, you know, not using an electronic means. So even lab work, x-rays, all of that type of technology was still very um, manual and antiquated. It started to change over the years as they started to look at um, how healthcare was a need in the community and how people were able to travel from one state to another. You know, back early 
before all the technology and being able to fly and, and move different places, people kind of stayed where they were born within, you know, a certain amount of, you know, miles away from where they, they lived and their families stayed together. Well, over time, as the transition to people being able to go by car and by plane, um, it became more common that they needed to have their, you know, medical records um, with them. So when they go to another facility or they had to have treatment, they had kind of their history of what was going on um, over time. You know, as conditions, um, people became chronic with conditions, especially things such as, you know, diabetes and heart disease and things that are pretty common in the United States, you know, having all of that data is great, but if you can't use it and you can't get, you know, treatment and make better treatment options for the patients, it wasn't as useful. So back in the beginning of time, they weren't able to kind of compare, you know, patients with their history was, what kind of medicines they were doing. So as they started to move to more um, of a centralized um, electronic record and having, you know, the paper turn into scan documents and then the scan documents turning into the electronic medical record, it started to get all of the information that was currently disparate over multiple, you know, systems and hospitals across the country into a more of a, a repository to be able to have a longitudinal record for a patient who may, you know, have grown up in New York but moved to Florida or, um, you know, had moved around to different places throughout their lifetime. So I think having, um, you know, in the beginning, it was always important. They knew documentation was important because if it wasn't documented, no one would know that it existed. But as they started to transition to the electronic record, they realized how much information is available and what they can use um, that information for, whether it's for new treatment um, technology, um, you know, being able to have insurance look at the best course of treatment to keep costs down, to perform audits, to make sure that, um, you know, they have the best practice. So, you know, if someone has a, a type of disease and they could look at it from one state to another, they can use different treatment methods that maybe they weren't aware of in the past because they can share that information. Of course, you know, insurance uses it for, um, you know, determining if the patient really needed to be in the hospital or if they needed to be seen as an outpatient. So all of these things developed over time with that information that they were able to now um, collect and use in a more structured way. It's still not where it needs to be. And that's part of where MRO is working with our technology to help share that clinical data with all the different data points and all the different requesters and um, regulatory compliance um, that's needed to share that information and to make the best decision for the patient. So you've touched on a couple of the uses. Uh, can you expand on some of those uses? Certainly uh, in, the, in the delivery for treatment purposes, that's the hub of, you know, most of the need for that, that documentation is to improve the treatment or follow-up care for patients. Uh, that you've elaborated on here nicely. Uh, but it's my understanding, of course, that there are many different demands and uses for that information. You touched on another one, and that's the insurance uh, industry wanting to have that information. How does that workflow uh, occur that the records are needed number one and that they're supplied number two uh, in the in the in the insurance or the payer side of the industry. So some of the other you know different you know ways that the information is needed, you know there's a lot of advancement with genetic testing, for example, doing um, you know hereditary type of documentation looking at the um, the patient's genetics and seeing how the information, how a certain disease or a, um, you know, something that they're experiencing with their, with their family is, you know, hereditary. So they can use, you know, information to treat um, and prescribe for new medications. They can look at patients' conditions that are, you know, chronic. And Don, so you were asking more of like how the um, information is supplied to different requesters and different organizations like for disease control, um, you know, reporting things. Is that kind of where you're going with that? And that and who else other than for direct patient care are demanding or needing that information today? 
wow, there's there's a lot of different um, places that it's needed. You know, if it's obviously required by, let's say, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, different insurance companies have requirements, but, you know, payment to providers, referral documentation, sending records to a referring doctor, audits. Um, you know, for whether we have a HEDIS request, a risk adjustment, you know, post-payment, prepayment, there's all kinds of reasons why it's, you know, not always tied to financials. Obviously, financial is important. You know, the the more financial, um, more sound you are with your finances, the more treatment options and the more care you can provide. So besides using that for, you know, audit, there's also regulatory compliance. You know, certain diseases have to be reported um, to the, you know, the state. There's some federal laws you know, keeping legal, you know, requirement that there's a subpoena or if a patient, let's say, got hurt at work and they had treatment through workers comp, social security disability, there's so many different organizations that need that information and they need it to be accurate, you know, complete and timely, which, you know, the the history of going from the paper to the electronic has really transformed the healthcare, you know, organizations across the country because of that. There's just so many different ways um, that there's probably 50 more that I can't even think of right now that, you know, that they use that information to make um, decisions for the patient, for their families, you know, for looking at communities, maybe if there's a certain type of disease going on within a, a community, all of that data helps them, you know, make decisions, whether they need to have more resources towards a certain drug or, um, or condition, or they need to develop you know, different medications to treat certain things. It's used in just various ways. Um, I know as my, in my past experiences, you know, there's a lot of automated reporting that we've been able to do over the years as it's moved to electronics. So there's not as much um, of a delay of getting that information from one organization to another, whether they access the electronic record or we send them a file or there's an interface between the system. Um, there's just, there's, lots and lots of ways that organizations use the data, you know, to help them make decisions and, and to treat the patients. Has the exchange of that information changed um, over the past few years? And if that, if the information is in electronic form and the industry is mostly electronic form, how has that change in providing that information occurred? So there's been a lot of advancement with the information, whether you have, um, you know, a certain EMR or there's, there's multiple ones, but, you know, there's a few big ones that exchange information a little bit easier than others. But we know that there is still not a consistent way for all of the EMRs to talk to each other and to send information the same way to a payer or to a clinical repository, whatever the need is, it's changed in the way that we have technology now that can take that data, normalize it, and send information to a requester um, based on you know certain data points that they might need. So to keep it consistent, um, having certain fields within your EMR that you know correspond from you know let's say you how you were admitted to the ER, how it's supply to the requester that it, it's the same across the board. And there are still some challenges with that because the data does not necessarily, um, is not captured the same way at each facility and each EMR has its, its differences. So that's kind of where we, we've been going towards is making sure that data can be transferred from whatever EMR it, it lives in into some sort of repository or some clinical record extraction to send that to the, the payers and to the requesters that it asked for it. When we introduce technology, and we, we've talked about it on the show before, how are we, we as an industry, still maintaining the integrity of that information on behalf of the patient to safeguard their privacy? Well, as everyone has heard about HIPAA, um, which has been around since I believe it was 96, 97, um, you know, patient confidentiality and security has always been um, at the top of, you know, the HIM industry. Um, you know, obviously, with the with the HIPAA implementation and privacy and security and the different acts over the years, there's been a lot of discussion, and sometimes it's hard to you know come to an agreement on you know how to secure information. Some people interpret things a little bit differently, 
But as a whole, people understand that you, know, you can't share um, information about a patient um, without their authorization. Um, you can share some data if you redact the information and just send some of the, um, you know, the data that they're looking for that doesn't have patient information. But it's very important that um, you know, the privacy of the patient is considered before you do anything. So you don't release you know, information to um, you know, other organizations that aren't allowed to get it, um, you know, having those laws in place and privacy and security, especially with the IT side. And we know there's a lot of, you know, issues and things in the news that you hear about, um, you know, having cyber attacks and things like that. It's important that the healthcare industry continues to, you know, have advancement in, in keeping the information secure. So whether it's, you know, Education and training obviously is one of the biggest parts with your, your teams, making sure they're not opening emails or going into websites that are, are you know, may cause um, you know, a data breach. So keeping that information secure requires a lot of different you know, parts of the organization to, to comply, but it's important that your technology behind the scenes really helps with that, whether it's you know, blocking certain emails that come through or not allowing um, certain links to be open keep that information from getting into, a, you know, an unfortunate cyber attack. And I know HIPAA, um, they were talking about making some changes to it, um, which we still haven't heard of the final you know, outcome. It's still to be determined, but they're realizing over, you know, time things have to evolve and be more, um, you know, within the technology at this time. So as things start to become easier to access, that means we have to have more security and making sure we're still not sharing patient information with someone who's not allowed to get it or that we're releasing records without their authorization. I, I agree as a, as a consumer and, you know, uh, from time to time, a patient myself, I certainly want to have assurances that the information that's contained in my record is protected and only disclosed upon you know, certain conditions. Obviously, one is my authorization. And most of the facilities now are very, very cognizant. Like you say, HIPAA has been in existence for many years now, since uh, the late, uh, late 96, 97 time period that you mentioned. And so I think most of uh, all providers are very, very cognizant of not disclosing information without the patient's consent and authorization. Obviously, in some emergency situations that um, there, there are some uh, various types of uh, disclosures that are appropriate on behalf of the patient, certainly. But still, nevertheless, there is the need for the information and meeting that need in a secure manner is utmost importance. And many, many regulations have been set up to protect the patient's information that are followed by the uh, healthcare industry. Right, and I, I've always said to people, um, you know, when it, obviously an emergency situation, you gotta think, okay, if I release this information, you know, how is it going to help the patient? And you know, thinking if you're doing it in good faith and that you're thinking through and making sure that you're not releasing, you know, records or information to a, a, a family member like an ex-spouse or something, um, you know, doing it in good faith usually will, will keep you out of trouble because you're doing it to make sure it's for the, you know, for the patient to get the information they need, but also to have some safeguards in place that you're not just giving out information when somebody calls for it. It's important that your, you know, organization has the, the training and, and the knowledge of how to keep information secure and which types of releases don't require that, you know, specific patient authorization um, that's kind of embedded into the law or to the, the process, whether you're you know, paying a claim for a, a certain insurance company or you're releasing you know, information that's required by law. So there's a lot of, um, you know, different ways that information is shared and it's done appropriately through the right mechanism, you know, legally without having any type of you know, an unauthorized um, incident. Allison, this has been very uh, interesting and informative. I I really appreciate your time today. So, thanks for uh, thank thanks for joining the program. Any uh, last minute thoughts on 
the history and the uses of the medical record and where it's heading for the future? Um, no, I think I covered it all. I just know that, you know, it's changing rapidly, um, you know, from where it was 10, 15 years ago. And the more you know, technology we use and the more EMR, you know, collaboration we have between um, different organizations, you know, the better off we'll be with, with sharing our data. So um, it's been exciting and I've enjoyed learning all the different um, and experiencing the different, you know, changes over the last 25 plus years. Has certainly, uh, technology has certainly brought in a, a whole list of different opportunities that healthcare industry providers uh, follow, and there's going to be many, many more changes as a result of technology that is a, a, that's being accommodated on behalf of the patient. So thank you again for joining. I, I really do appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me, Don. For more information and insight on the patient's medical record through the healthcare system, visit the show's page on MROCORP.com and be sure to explore our additional resources and thought leadership on our website. Please check out the program on healthcarenowradio.com. That's all one word. Finally, be sure to connect with us on Twitter at MRO. C-O-R-P. Until we talk again, I'm your host, Don Hardwick.